A reading from the book of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to string up before all the nations. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in praying Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, then were we will like those who dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter, and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses of the Negev. Those who sowed with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying the seed, will come again with joy, shouldering their sheaves. A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Thessalonians. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of the prophets, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. The Lord has done great things for us and we are glad indeed. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory be to thee, O Lord. 
There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing, if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know. The one who is coming after me, I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to thee, O Christ. Friends, I greet you today um, from my home because of my isolating, because of exposure to COVID-19. We hope all will be well. And talking about exposure, have you personally had much exposure to the Psalms in your life? Perhaps not much beyond these brief extracts which we recite during the Eucharist, just before the proclamation of the gospel. And just coming out of the blue, the psalm verses make very little sense. Now, it is actually worth reminding ourselves that the psalm verses are definitely not another reading from the Bible. The psalms are hymns. They are sacred poems composed to be sung. Ideally, we should be singing them as we sing a hymn rather than read the stanzas from the hymn book. And it is good to remember that the Psalms are in fact central to Anglican lay spirituality. In the English Reformation, the Psalms in English were divided up into 60 sections. And in the Book of Common Prayer, one of these portions was allocated to morning prayer and the next to evening prayer every day so that in every parish church they would be prayed morning and evening and for those who couldn't join in in person they could use their own book of common prayer at home as a resource to be used to follow along with the church's progress through the Psalter. Now the Psalms can only go so far in snippets, rather it is through familiarity with them over time that we discover their infinite suggestiveness. The Psalms are discovered over time to stimulate our spiritual imagination. They are provocative. They galvanize our feelings and thoughts because they give voice to an extraordinary gamut of human aspirations and emotions and reactions challenging us to be as emotionally honest with God ourselves as the psalmists are. The imagery of the psalms ranges up and down the whole scales of human experience, giving poetic expression to grief, precariousness, fear, longing, regret, joy, anger, repose, restlessness, adoration, bliss, gratitude, despair, faith, 
and loss of faith, and so on and on. And today, the third Sunday of Advent, we prayed Psalm 126, which concludes with these verses. Those who sowed with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying the seed, will come again with joy, shouldering their sheaves. These verses have pointed to the depths of human experience with God for hundreds of generations. Let's explore them further. Now, first, they contain echoes from over 10,000 years ago, from the very dawn of agriculture and the dawn of religions as we know them. Because scholars tell us that the development of both were very much intertwined. The psalmist's imagery alluded to ancient pagan rituals from the dawn of time. When our remote ancestors sowed their fields with seed, the actions were accompanied by ritual weeping and lamenting and mourning. At harvest time, though, the rituals were joyful for celebration of resurrection and rebirth through feasting, drinking, and a lot of sex. Myths of the descent of fertility gods into the underworld and their revival with the turn of the seasons were sung. But the Hebrew psalmist is deploying this ancient mythic poetry to raise profound existential issues of life experience. Now, when you come to think of what life is like for subsistence farmers, you realize how sad and scary the time for sowing could be when it came round. How tempting it must have been for farmers living on the edge of starvation and famine to make bread out of the seeds they had reserved for sowing. How risky and painful it must have seemed to bury that precious grain in the ground, to lose it, to let it go in the hope that it would mysteriously spring up months later as a new crop. And today, these verses provoke us to some deep meditation on the painful necessity of letting go if there is to be new growth, new life, and new nourishment. If we hang on to our stuff, if we hoard what we have, it can never give rise to new life. So Jesus himself used the metaphor of the painful and risky burying of seed to symbolize the very principle of authentic living by faith and the fundamental truth that he was living out by willingly going to his death instead of saving his life by fleeing. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. John 12, 24. It is a paradox that is at the core of his teaching. Those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Mark chapter 8 verse 35. Now at this time of global crisis during the pandemic, we are being rather savagely reminded that change is forced upon us, whether we like it or not. Think back about how many changes are underway that may never be reversed about how and where we work, how we interact and play, how we travel and connect, even what kind of money is used. We are having to let go very quickly of so many things we assumed were permanent. The dizzying impact of these changes are hard to take in. 
and the pattern of our lives in Christian communities, such as our All Souls, is being so disrupted that our church isn't going to work anymore as a haven where we can shelter from change. The reason why so many institutions and parishes will crumble under the strain is that our spirituality and our religious culture haven't had enough depth. We have treated the church as a reassuring club rather than as a living organism which continually lets go of what is unfit for our future and continually creates with the Holy Spirit what is life-giving for a new time. These psalm verses remind us that letting go in order to sow seeds of newness is a process that calls for grief because letting go can never, ever be easy. And then the psalm verses remind us that times of grief and loss actually do contain the seeds of new life within them. The poet Rilke exclaims in one of his Duino elegies, oh, we wasters of sorrows. So can I ask you this morning, have you taken stock of the seeds of new life that are hidden in the afflictions of the present time? I really beg you as a pastor not to waste times of precariousness, anxiety, and grief. Don't waste them. Find the seeds at their core. If your loved one has contracted COVID-19, redouble your gratitude and resolve that after her or his recovery, you will embrace tenderness and thankfulness more than ever before. Is your sense of mortality oppressing you? Make a will, revise it, tackle the issues in your life you have been sweeping under the rug. The Holy Spirit will help you because the Holy Spirit specializes uh, in waking us up from our procrastination. Have you come out of taking a COVID-19 test, really starting to wonder what lies beyond death? Well then, don't waste that. It's time to get a proper spiritual life and to start sharing your hopes and fears with the God of love. And again, are you a bit sick already about missing the Eucharist and worship together in community? Then don't just moan to yourself. Redouble your gratitude and commitment in readiness for regathering. Make and increase your pledge. Promise yourself not to take for granted the rich meaningfulness of being a member of the body of Christ, even in its very imperfect manifestation. Redouble your promise to yourself not to take for granted that this membership in the body of Christ and in a beloved parish gives you purpose and a vocation in community. And then prepare to reap with songs of joy on condition that you have done the work of sowing the seeds while you weep.